Okay, so let's pick up where we left off before. We before talked about the three questions and deciding whether someone needs to be resuscitated, starting with some initial steps. We checked the pulse and we talked about ventilations. So now we're at this part here, where after 30 seconds, we're going to check a pulse again. So you check the pulse, precordial or umbilical, and if it's greater than 100, uh, you're done. Admit them to the NICU and let someone smarter than me take over. Uh, well, what if it's not greater than 100? What if it is between 60 and 100? Then we need to improve our ventilations that we're doing. And if it's even lower than that, so we have a persistent bradycardia, now it's time to up our game. We're going to do chest compressions and switch from room air to 100% O2. Uh, so let's take a look at these. So how are you going to fix the ventilations to improve them? Well, there's a mnemonic I heard called uh, Mr. Sopa from uh, a talk that Amal Matu gave. Uh, Mr. Sopa. I think it probably would make more sense to call it Mr. Soap, but whatever. Okay, so M stands for mask readjustment. Reposition the airway. Suction. Open the mouth. Pressure increase. And finally, airway adjuncts. And I take that to mean you either intubate them or put in an LMA. An LMA is a laryngeal mask airway. It's like this triangular shaped thing that you could stick down the throat and you can give air through it then. You can ventilate them through it. Now this has to be used in uh, babies that are more than 34 weeks or more than 2,000 grams. There is limited evidence in any, any of the smaller babies so just intubate the smaller ones. So that's if we're between 60 and 100, we're going to use Mr. Sopa to help us better ventilate the baby. If we're less than 60, if we check the pulse, then it's time to do chest compressions and give 100% O2. So let's take a moment to talk about chest compressions. Now remember in pediatric codes and resuscitations, ventilations are more important. So this is what needs to take uh, priority. So before you jump on chest compressions, make sure you that, that you're giving good ventilations. And there's really two ways to do good uh, chest compressions in these kids. The first is something called the two-finger technique, where one hand is placed on the sternum at the bottom third of the sternum, with, and with your index and middle finger you press down. The other hand goes behind the back of the kid. And you're going to do your compressions so that you get about one-third of the AP diameter of the chest. Uh, that's, that's pretty deep. Now this is not the preferred technique. The other technique is called the thumb encircling technique. And you can see you got two hands. Again, one is grabbing this side of the baby and the other is grabbing the other side with your thumb on the top and your fingers going around the back. And you use your thumbs to cause uh, the chest compressions. And this is thought to generate better systolic pressures and coronary perfusion pressures than the two uh, finger technique. Now, the only thing is, if you want to put in an umbilical line or you need to do something here, look, the, these arms are in the way, so that's why some people might use this. Some people will advocate, well, instead of standing over here, put your arms out this way, uh, and then, then they can work over here. But that assumes that you're not in the way of the person ventilating. So just know, thumb encircling technique, that's the preferred way. And so whatever method you use, you want to... Uh, give three compressions and then one breath. So you're going to go squeeze, 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 breathe. So again, it goes squeeze, 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 breathe. Squeeze, 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 breathe. And the important thing to know is that when you're doing this breathe, you do not do a squeeze. Because the thought is, if you're squeezing, then you're going to impede air moving in. And remember, our ventilations are the important thing. And the goal here is to get about 120 events per minute, they said. So this is an event, that's an event, that's an event, that's an event. So you're probably going to do uh, 90 compressions and 30 breaths in a minute. And you will be continuing this coordinated compressions and ventilations until the spontaneous heart rate is greater than 60. So let's say we're doing all this, and then we check a pulse again, and the heart rate is still less than 60. Now it's time for epinephrine. In the past, they used to say you could give epinephrine either through the ET tube or through the IV, but now we're saying there's no evidence for endotracheal epinephrine, so give it in through the IV. But how the heck do you get an IV on these little babies? Well, you got a real easy vein to hit. It's in the umbilical stump. 
And how do you know which ones are the arteries and which ones are the veins? Of course, they're not going to be nicely colored like in my picture. The arteries are going to be the thicker-walled uh, blood vessels, and the veins gives you the bigger, floppier one. And so you could think of it, since this looks like a smiley face, that you don't want to poke this guy in the eye, but you want to put the straw in his mouth. And there are usually going to be two arteries and one vein, but sometimes there's one artery. But just remember, just remember to put it in through the floppier, bigger one and not the thicker walled one. That's, that's your goal. So the dose of epinephrine is 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 milligrams per kilogram. That's one dose. And you're going to use the 1 to 10,000 dilution. That is, you're going to use the more dilute of the two. You're not going to use the concentrated 1 to 1,000. You're going to use the dilute 1 to 10,000. And that's about 0.1 milligrams per ml. Higher doses of epinephrine have not been shown to be helpful, so that's what we're sticking with there. And what about IV fluids? Uh, you should consider it if there's blood loss or you suspect that, uh, that they're uh, hypovolemic, like a pale skin, perf poor perfusion, or they're not really responding to anything else, you could try a 10 cc per kilo bolus. But just remember this, that in premature infants, giving uh, rapid infusions of large volumes has, can lead to intraventricular hemorrhage. So giving large volumes fast can lead to intraventricular hemorrhage in these preemies. Okay, we got a few more things to talk about. Uh, they talk about naloxone and how it's really not been shown to help. And they talk about glucose and that there's really no specific target to aim for, but avoid hypoglycemia. They talk about therapeutic hypothermia, and there is a role for that, especially for kids greater than 36 weeks. So we want to initiate it within six hours. Keep them maintained there for 72 hours, and then rewarm them over four hours. This stuff will be probably taken care of by protocols uh, in your NICU uh, or PICU, if that's where it goes. So what we want to do in the emergency room is just make sure that we initiate. And they didn't mention how, but in adults, we would initiate with cooled IV fluids. I'm guessing if we want to be careful with fluids, then you could try cool blankets as well. And the idea, the idea here is that uh, you want to pre uh, prevent any cognitive, any brain injury, any hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy by keeping them cool. And then the last thing they talk about is uh, about withholding resuscitation and discontinuing resuscitation. And they make a, a point that, it, that uh, not initiating resuscitation is ethically the same as discontinuing resuscitation. And they really came up with three scenarios. In some situations, like when the child's unlikely to survive, then uh, resuscitation is not indicated. And so they gave some examples here, like really, really young babies, preemie, 23 weeks or less, 400 grams of really small ones, anencephaly, or those with uh, major chromosomal abnormalities. And those with a high survival rate, like maybe those who are more than 25 weeks, resuscitation, resuscitation is almost always indicated. And if you're on the borderline, then they suggest that you ask the parents. Now, you know what I would say, actually? I'm going to ask the parents in this one and this group, too. I think it's only fair to include the parents in the decision-making process. And when would you discontinue resuscitation? Uh, they make the point of saying that if you have no heartbeat for 10 minutes, then you can consider discontinuing. Uh, again, in this point, I would probably also talk with the parents about it, too, before stopping anything. Well, uh, that's kind of a sad note to end this on. So let's do a, a very quick review. So we talked about uh, when we want to initiate them, the resuscitation. After asking these three questions, if you answer no to any of them, we do our initial steps. Then we check for a pulse. If we got a pulse greater than 100, send them off to the NICU. Otherwise, you have one minute to do a bunch of stuff. You're going to do chest compressions. For, I'm not chest compression, you're going to do ventilations on room air for 30 seconds. After that, you're going to check a pulse. If the pulse is greater than 100, hooray, send them off to the NICU. If it's in this intermediate zone, you're going to improve your ventilations. Remember, Mr. Sopa. And then finally, if it's less than 60, that's when you start your chest compressions and you crank the oxygen up to 100% O2. 
You do that, you check a pulse again. If they're still less than 60, then you're going to give epinephrine. Now let's compare this to the diagram that they supplied. And you can see that it's the, pretty much the same thing. Here's your three questions. And if they're okay, you're going to do the normal care. If not, warm, clear, and dry and stimulate. If it's less than 100, you're going to start ventilations, right? If you... Uh, then you're going to check a pulse. And remember, this is your golden minute, birth to 60, right? And then if you're still under 60 seconds, I mean, still under 100, then uh, you're going to check. Are we less than 60? Then we're going to intubate and do chest compressions. If we're just less than 100, then we're going to do our corrective ventilation steps. Again, we go down here. If we're still less than 60, then it's time for epinephrine. And we talk about our numbers here for uh, the pulse oximeter. Look at one minute. It's only 60 to 65. At 5 minutes, it's only 80 to 85. And at 10 minutes, it's 85 to 95 percent. Okay, that's it. I hope that was not too much. And if uh, you have any questions, go ahead and put it in the comments below. And if you have more questions, go ahead and look for that um, paper. It's in circulation, November 2010. It's part 15. All right, thanks. Bye.